my future written Your heart loves with no condition Oh, 
at New Church. Did you guys just do uh, Graves in the Gardens, I think? So that's one of my favorite songs. I'm Pastor Corey. If we haven't met my lovely wife, I have taken my bride on a trip someplace warm. Hopefully the weather is nice for us. I don't care about the weather at home right now. Um, but I have a special guest for you today. But um, before I introduce him, uh, who, whom you know, I have a couple of uh, great announcements. We have First Wednesday coming up on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. I have my friend, Pastor Jake and Mullen, is coming. I'm going to be here, but Pastor Jake is coming. He's got a really uh, incredible prophetic word for the church. Wednesday at 7 o'clock, uh, child care here as well. we got a men's breakfast. Uh, men get signed up. I've got a, a great topic about how do we reach men with the gospel. You're going to love it. Uh, why does Venue Church have to be a, a church that men love to go to? Um, but without further ado, I would love to introduce my dad, Pastor Richard. Would you welcome him to the stage right now, please? Come on up, Dad, Pastor Richard. Uh, my dad was my pastor for most, all of my growing up, actually, most of my growing up, actually. Um, but he is still a pastor here. He's retired now. We just call him pastor out of respect. But he has a great word of God for you. Um, and the last thing I will say before he takes, uh, takes over is all of his childhood stories about me are complete lies and fabrication. Don't believe a word that he says. I'll be back to correct all of that uh, this week. So love you guys, and we'll see you soon. What a, what a blessing to have my own son introduce me. That's uh, amazing. And I see that mo all my life I poured my life into him. Now he's pouring his life into me, and I'm so happy to call him my pastor. And... Um, I'm a little disappointed because uh, when he heard I was going to be preaching this Sunday, he booked it out of town. So, I don't know. What, what's going on? Not only that, you know, we've been praying that, that there will be no hecklers in the service. Right? Right? No hecklers. And all the hecklers have gone on cruises. So mention it to them when they get back. It was peaceful in the service without them. We're so glad to be able to share the gospel with you. Do we really believe the words we're singing? He turns bones into armies. You know that comes right out of the scriptures. If you don't believe it, just go to Ezekiel. Read Ezekiel. And it, the story is there in Ezekiel. I love, I love when we, we're singing the gospel. Um, that's when life begins to happen. Uh, do you believe in miracles? You see, what's, what Satan wants to do, he wants to destroy your future, discourage you from moving into the future because the future, if you get miracles now, the future is exciting. And he does not want you to have that excitement in your life. Yeah, I believe in miracles. You know, I walked my father through three or four heart attacks. And uh, I didn't even know he had a heart attack. I don't know if he did either. Found him one day lying beside the tractor in the field in the shade of the, the wheel. And as I was working out there with him, and uh, I went and I shook him, woke him up. You okay, Dad? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm, I'm just not feel well. I think I'll walk home. It's about three quarters of a mile home. So he left the tractor sitting in the field and he walked home. He had a, had a heart, heart attack. He never even went to the doctor. You know, one other time he's coming home from town with a truckload of grain and he runs into the ditch and overturns the truck and destroys the truck and he walks out of it. That was his heart attack number two. And he had some he kept from me. But the final one, we, uh, his final heart attack, uh, he, he was so, we took him to the doctor. Doctor checked him out. And uh, uh, when he checked him out, he said, um, he sent his clothes home. He said, he won't be needing these. He said, he's not seen that much damage in a heart that he could remember. And... Uh, so I had a little chat with my dad. He said, call Uncle Jake. Uncle Jake was his older half-brother who lived in Ontario. And uh, we called Uncle Jake. He flew out, took him to the hospital. And uh, I remember Uncle Jake, he was the guy who only had one thumb. He had one thumb missing. And he always told us the story that a dog chewed his thumb off. So he was a real unique guy in our lives. So anyway, Uncle Jake went in there with my dad. He spent a couple of hours with my dad that day. And I don't know what happened that day, but some of the things we sing in these songs happened that day in that room because about, uh, about a week or 10 days later, we brought our clothes to, my, to the hospital, took my dad home, and he, he was good for five years. See, I believe in miracles. Miracles is Jesus' signature. Thanks, Sean. You're a miracle, too. 
Sean has been part of my life for a long time. So, anyway, I'm going to tell you some of my story today. And uh, uh, we're, we're, going to, we're going to set you up for a miracle. Okay, you ready for a miracle? If you don't like miracles, you can identify with the scribes and Pharisees in the Bible. They didn't like Jesus doing what he did either. And so, and they were always mad at him, and they were mad at the things he did, and so they just left the meeting. Lock up. We don't have any scribes and Pharisees here, do we? Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about a subject. I, I shared this in Cuba uh, here a few months, a couple of months ago. Uh, I call it the, uh, what's in your filing cabinet? What do you have in you? You know, many years ago, I developed a system of storage. And uh, it was an old-fashioned filing cabinet like that. And uh, the one I've got, it, it stands about this high. It's got four drawers, four long drawers in it. And you pull it out, they're all full of files. And those files document some of the important things that happened in my life and some so, that are not so important that I'd like to forget, but they're there anyway. And every once in a while, I have to go through my filing cabinet and, and purge out some of the stuff I don't need because, you know, stuff gets old, and you have to get rid of it. And so I, I go through it. And, but I've stored things there from 50 years ago. Um, when Beth and I got married, I, I knew I needed something. We didn't have stuff like, like uh, these, these crazy iPhones. You never know what will come out of these things, you know. Yeah, you can put stuff in, but you don't know where it is. You never know if it'll come out. It won't, never changed my heart. But you know, the filing cabinet, the, the filing cabinet that I'm going to be talking about, the filing cabinet we have right in here. What are you putting in there? But it started with having a filing system, and uh, you you can't trust this phone. The other day, two days ago, I was in my bed in the morning after after I was we we do our devotional time in bed. We have coffee in bed and stuff like that. And then we have our devotional time for about an hour, hour and a half. And that's when we're filling up. And so I, uh, Beth got up to make breakfast. And so I, uh, I went on my phone and I said, I said to Siri, uh, where's Jesus? And just quick as a flash, I got an answer. I'm here. <laughs> I thought, this thing is dangerous. <laughs> I'm here. It was a female voice. Very pleasant. Very nice. You know, respectful. I'm here. I thought, I'm not opening that phone again. <laughs> you know, I used to gather information because uh, there may be some, some things you'll need tomorrow. So you put them away today. All my business transactions um, I put away. The documents, the records of business, and all my finances, and, and uh, all of the, you know, the government stuff, CRA stuff. You've got to keep that kind of stuff so that you know what, you know, you might have to refer to it later. Uh, family treasures, all our ministry events. You know, all of, we've, we've done about 60 ministry trips, I have, overseas, most of it the third world, and it's all documented. Every place I went, the times, and who I went, went with us, we've taken about 300, 250 people with us overseas, and that all became part of our lives, and it was filed away. Not only was it filed away in the filing cabinet, it was filed away here. But I can always go back there and refer to it. That's what's key about having a good filing system. You can refer to it. We, after we moved to Airdrie uh, here about just about six years ago now, we uh, got a letter from the government. You know, CRA, crazy something or other. <laughs> CRA, they, they, they sent me a letter. You owe us $6,000. And so I went to my filing cabinet. I opened up their file. And I took it out, and I gave it to Pastor Erin because she takes care of this stuff really well. She makes a few phone calls, sends some letters, and sends some forms in, this and that. And about three, three weeks later or so, I get a check for $3,000. Good thing I kept the file because now I had something to refer to and to send to them. So it's very important to keep good records. Um, all of our ministry events, our missions, uh, we've got records. All my teaching materials. You know, I've got about 250 or so in, in my computer. You know, I've got, I've got this filing cabinet, too. I've got this one, too. And I've got my computer. And I've got my laptop. And there's files in all of them. But, uh, but uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got stuff that I can go get tangible, get out, and look it over. And it helps to remind me what I've done. Okay? It's very important. So... 
Uh, what was I telling you? Uh, I've got so many things. Oh, yeah, filing cabinet. Uh, all of ministry stuff we do, it's in the file. Okay. Uh, we, we got Sean over here. His Dacia took off already. Uh, I don't know if he knew it, but he is in my filing cabinet. He dwells there. Because we watched him for a couple of years. They're fooling around, fooling around, fooling around. Finally, they said, we're in love. Let's do, let's do the thing. Let's get married. So they went and got the documents. Once I get that document and we have a ceremony and we register him into my filing cabinet. So he's lived there now for how many years, Sean? How many? 14 years? 16 years. In fact, just talk to Pastor Corey sometime. Ask him, how is it in the filing cabinet? Because he's been in my filing cabinet for 25 years this year. Don't forget. Pastor Corey, Pastor Aaron, in my filing cabinet. And anytime there's any question about this or that or the other, about uh, what happened, I pull the, pull the file out and say, you said. Because it's documented. You're going to love and cherish? Yeah, that's what you said. So I've got the evidence here. So live up to what's in my filing cabinet. And so we store you. Okay, if you have anything to do with me, we store you. And if I outlive you, there might be another thing that might be stored in there, too, because I do funerals. And once, once I've got you in that kind of a situation, into my filing cabinet, forever. Okay, we take care of you. Okay, then we know we, we can go back there. I've got my mother and father in my filing cabinet, too. I don't know how, if they'd pre appreciate that much, that much. And I've got best mom and dad, and I've got all kinds of people that I've served in a capacity of uh, their, their funeral uh, service, you know. And it's, it's a blessing to be able to go back and say, this is what I preached that day. This is the scripture I referred to. It's all documented. So filing is very important. And in the same way that we, we but it needs to be cleaned out every once in a while. Keep the good stuff. And get rid of the bad stuff. And the filing cabinet that you have in here, every once in a while, like about daily, you need to get some rid of some stuff. That's called confession. That's how you get rid of stuff that you don't need. So we need to get rid of stuff, clean it out. It requires a regular cleaning. And then it'll be useful for you when you need what's in there. Okay. In the same way, we build our character. Okay. My father began to build something in me. Many, many years ago, when I was a little kid. Okay, that, that's just about, you know, a century ago. And uh, he, he started to impart some things to me. Because I was raised on a farm. We had nine kids. We had, you know, a lot of pressure in the, in the household. And so I learned a work ethic when I was very young because I was the oldest son. So uh, I got to do all the good stuff with my dad. And in these times we had together, he showed me what his character was, and he expected me to adopt that and store it right here. Honesty, integrity, your word is your life. You don't say something and then do something else. You don't make a promise and not keep it. Never. So my father taught me a lot of things. He was a giant in my life. Um, he, uh, the people that we grow up with influence us, and sometimes they're damaging influences, and we file them. And those damaging influences, uh, influences follow us, and they affect us. They affect our walk. They make us cripples. They cause us to be bent over. Remember the story in the Bible where a woman came to the church. Jesus was having a service, and a woman comes in. The Bible says she was bent over, and she couldn't in no ways raise her up. We get to the place sometimes if we store the wrong things in here that we cannot raise ourselves up anymore because we're discouraged, we're broken, we're failures, uh, we have no hope anymore, and we walk like this all the time in our minds because of what we've stored in here. It's become part of our being, part of our character. And the whole point of Jesus come, coming to this earth is demonstrated in this, this what happened that day in that service where the scribes and Pharisees were watching him to make sure that he didn't do something that didn't quite agree with him. It was a Sabbath day for one thing. So lay off the works. <laughs> That's how they're thinking. And so she comes in and he raises her up. He says, this woman who's been bowed down for all these years by the devil, 
It's time she has something else in her character. And he gave her the life that only Jesus can give and raised her up. And that's our role in the church today. You know, that's what miracles are all about. Every place Jesus went, he did miracles. You know, they didn't have any uh, uh, advertising system. You know, Jesus, the man, he's going to be, he's going to be at the stadium and such and such a day. They just, they, they heard about miracles. Miracles attract people to Jesus because they need him. We need him. We need miracles. And so they didn't, have, they didn't even get a permit. They had, they, they had this meeting. They had 5,000 men plus women and children. So that's about 10,000 maybe in the crowd. They didn't even get a permit to hold the meeting. And they didn't have the venue worship team there either. They didn't even have a song. Jesus had it hard. Uh, we got it easy, man. We got a microphone. We can yell all we like. Everybody can hear us. He had his voice. Can you imagine the miracle of Jesus communicating with 10,000 people and everybody heard clearly? That's a miracle in itself. Can you imagine 10,000 people with, with no place to go, no building, no shelter in case it hails or snows or something? They just gathered because they heard about the man who did the miracles. They came from outside the country to come to the meeting. And, they, you know, there's no complaints. Where do you park our donkeys? You know, where's the parking staff? We've, we've we traveled a long ways. We've got our, all our pack, backpacks and stuff. Where do we store this stuff? And where's the toilets? Have you ever thought about the, some of the things that he did where there's 10,000 people gathered, no toilet at all, not even one portable? Would you go to a meeting like that? Oh, no, brother. I'm sanitary. <laughs> got to keep my sanitary. I got to keep my sanity too. <laughs> 10,000 people. Can you imagine 10,000 folding chairs? Everybody carrying a folding chair? Parked on a hillside? Okay. You move my chair. You're sitting on my chair. That's my spot. Okay. Can you imagine the chaos that, that could have prevailed? And then he preaches so long. And the, the meeting goes so long, and he, he keeps preaching. Everybody's thirsty and hungry. And nobody brought, even brought a, a Starbucks or anything. They're thirsty and hungry. Then they said, what are we going to do with feeding all these people? They want to stay for the, the, the afternoon meeting. What are we going to do with them? McDonald's was closed for the night. And, and so one of, his, one of his dream team, the 12, they say, there's a kid that's got some lunch. They stole his lunch. The only guy in the place that got any food, they went and stole the kid's lunch. <laughs> Jesus was up against it. You know, we've got everything here. I so appreciate the music ministry and the dream team and everybody's working together so that we could have a miracle. But, you know, most of us would rather just come in here and have life as it was yesterday. And we're not really anticipating or looking for something really really different and challenging and that would deliver us from our bad relationships and the suffering that we're that we have uh, that we've ex been exposed to from our childhood we never got written up, rid of because we have never gotten lifted up by Jesus well if you get the right thing in here if you have the right character you have to get the right thing in here and you let the man reign in here You'll be lifted up today. Whatever it is you came in with, whether it's a broken relationship or you're having suffering with your kids or your, your marriage or suffering at work, whatever it is, Jesus can take care of it all because that's who he is and that's why he came, to take care of it all. You see, we develop our spiritual life in the same way that we develop a filing cabinet, little by little by little. I had a guy in our, in our uh, worship team one time, he said, oh, I'd like to just sit down and spend the time with Jesus so everything would be changed and then I could really come and minister. And I thought, it won't happen. You've got to take a little at a time. That's why he's given us the scripture because you can take a little bit at a time, a bite at a, at a time. But you've got to be persistent, got to keep after it. Jesus said, and I'm going to refer to a couple of passages, John chapter 8 and verse 31, he's talking to the Jews. 
And he said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my words, you are my disciples. Did you notice he, the word says abide? So he wants to come and take up residence. Abide. Like move in? Have meals? Yeah. Every day, all day. He doesn't want to just come and visit so often. In our culture today, we want just like a 15-second a visit. Get what I want, get what I need, and bye-bye. But he wants us to come and abide. He wants, to check. he wants to stay around for a while. So make a way for Jesus to abide in you. He said, um, he said if, and you shall know the truth. If he abides in you, you shall know the truth. So often we misquote the scriptures. We don't take it in context. Abiding only comes by taking a passage of scripture and taking it in the whole context of who wrote it, who it's to, and what it's for. Then we get the principle of it in our hearts and we file it in here. Once you have filed something in here from Jesus abiding in you, you can pull it out at will if you're wise. You can pull it out at will. And use that, whatever he's put in here. It's his life that he gives us by abiding in us. The truth, when he abides, truth comes to us. And that truth, when it comes out, it'll make you free. And it'll cause you, when you bow down, it'll cause you to be raised up. And you'll have self-worth and Jesus will begin to flow through you. In John chapter 15, this is what Jesus said uh, to, to the people who are listening to him. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. You hear that? It goes both ways. If you abide in me while my words abide in you, you shall ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. You can ask anything. You can ask for a miracle today, but there has to be an abiding first, a humility to surrender, to yield yourself to him so he can speak. You retain and then let it come back out. And it'll produce a miracle. The seed of a miracle is the word of God. So you can ask what you desire. When I first saw that, I started asking for all kinds of stuff. I'll tell you, I had no limit. Whatever you desire, yeah. But I forgot about the abiding. Because if he abides in me, I will, I will only ask what he desires. Because he is abiding in me. And whatever he desires that I ask, God has already planned to make that come to pass. Yeah, Jesus' miracles were not haphazard, okay? They were, the, they, were, they were the fact of God working through his son with his word and putting it on people. So it, it's just an amazing promise. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So you become a disciple once you abide, and once you do the word, because the word only abides if you do it, it'll, it'll start to live in you. And then you can ask what you want. And it blesses the Lord so much when we start to bear fruit. That's our, our whole goal is to bear fruit, to do the works of Jesus. I want to tell you a couple of stories. You have to dig down, dig down, dig down. The key to abiding is digging down. You know, when you, you, you hear about these gold, these people are, who are gold diggers, you know, they hear about a gold rush someplace and they rush off. And people are uh, out in the mountain with shovels and digging, and they're walking by with, with nuggets in their hand. And, and so many people just sit there and they say, well, I sure like some of those nuggets, but they, they don't bring a shovel. They never dig. They don't build a house when it's calm. They don't build a house when they have time. They don't dig, but they want the nuggets. They want the miracle. But you, if you go and dig, Jesus will come. It's like sitting by a stream. They're panning for gold. Yeah, I got some gold. I got some gold. People are walking around talking about the gold they've got. You say, I'd sure like some of that gold. And you sit there and oh, I'm sure not getting into that filthy river. That's the river of life. It's dirty. It's confused. Okay, we've got to dig into the scriptures so that we can deal with that river. And we'll have gold. So keep, keep on abiding. Dig deep. You dig then you do, and that's called serving, yeah. obeying God. You can only use that which is kept in your heart. You cannot get it on Google. You've got to dig it out. Dig it out of, the, dig it out of the, where, the, where the gold is. 
Okay, the interesting thing in Acts chapter 3, I'm going to just paraphrase this. There was a, there was a man who had take, been, he had been a cripple from his birth. It says he's a man, so it's got to be some years already. And he, every day he was carried to the gate where he would beg because that's all he knew. That's all that was in his, him, his filing cabinet is I'm a cripple. I've got to have help. Somebody has to carry me. I'm dependent on the people. I'm dependent on, you know, how, how gracious the people are, how generous they are. I'm dependent on it all every day. Then he'd go home. He'd get carried home. Some days maybe he uh, was hungry when he went home because people were not so generous as he thought. But he'd sit there with his hand out, and all he had was defeat in him, trusting somebody to help him out. And so he'd sit at the gate to the temple because usually people that go to pray have a little bit of compassion. We'll give him a little bit. That's why he was there. So one day Peter and John came by, and here he was, faithful as usual, sitting in his spot. Somebody had carried him. And here he's sitting, and he reaches out his hand for he wants some, he wants some money. And so Peter and John come by, and they say, well, buddy, we don't have any silver and gold, but such as we have. What are they talking about? They're talking about the three years they spent with Jesus, walking with Jesus, having an impartation from Jesus, filing these things away, watching what Jesus did, repeating what Jesus did, doing what he commanded them to do. And that day, just the, this crippled man was there with his hand out, Peter reaches down, and he took him by the hand, and he says, such as I have. It was the anointing of Jesus on him, and that anointing went to him. That's why it's so key to touch people. The anointing that's on Jesus can come through you to touch people. That's why it, it was a sacrilege when during this, that whole COVID time, you'd see signs in the school, don't touch. Keep your hands off. Jesus said touch. He said lay hands on the sick. So Peter reached out, and he, such as, he said, such as we have, we give to you. And something electric went into that man who had never walked. His feet and ankles had no memory of walking or standing or crawling or anything. He was a cripple. And when that life went into him, the Bible says his, his ankle bones and his feet, they received strength. And he jumped up. Can you imagine somebody who had never stood jumps up? And he starts walking and leaping and praising God. And the scribes and Pharisees are sitting there, why did he do that? We don't know this guy. He's a, we, want him, we want to know him as a cripple. We don't want to know him as somebody who's been touched by Jesus. But they just gave him what they had. What's in you? Do you have that in you? Do you have it to give to the person sitting beside you today? In church, just touching them, say, in the name of Jesus, such as we have, we're giving to you. You know, these things on the end of our arms, they're, they have a purpose. They're made for something. They're not used for flying. They're to be put on people in a respectful and holy and a believing way, say, in the name of Jesus. And we need to do that with our kids. We have trouble with our kids sometimes. Do you, when you put them to bed, do you lay your hands on their head and bless them and say, in the name of Jesus? Okay? That's how you begin to transmit life. It's what's in your filing cabinet. So this man got not what he wanted. He got what he needed, the anointing of God. I want to refer to a passage today in Mark chapter 5. One of my favorite passages, so encouraging. Uh, Mark chapter 5, there's a woman who had an issue of blood. Do you ever read that story? Mark chapter 5, verse 27. Um, no, I I'm, I'm should be looking at, uh, yeah, Mark chapter 5. Still got it wrong. I will find it. Siri, where is it? <laughs> a woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. She had suffered many things from many physicians, and she had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had a flow of blood for 12 years. Can you imagine, after a week of this, or two weeks, you women know, after a couple of weeks of this, you think something's wrong. 
got up in the morning, hmm, blood. That's not good. Another week goes by. You get up in the morning, hmm, blood. And you check at noon, hmm, still blood after two or three months. Ah, bleeding, bleeding all the time. Keep on bleeding. After two or three years, you're still bleeding and it doesn't quit. What's going into your filing cabinet? You go to the doctor. He gives you a diagnosis. He says, do this. He takes your money. It's going in your filing cabinet. Money gone, money gone. Another diagnosis, another promise. Still bleeding. After five or six years, still bleeding. No. After 10 years, still bleeding. You've got no money left. You've got nothing to live on. You're ostracized from the public because at that day, if you had that kind of a condition, you were not allowed to go into public or you would, if somebody saw it, you would get stoned to death. That was the penalty. So she had a death sentence on her. She, it was filed. Death sentence. No help till one day she heard by the grapevine, there's a man. There's a man, Jesus. A crazy man. He's doing miracles. And demons are being cast out and people are being healed of every disease and epileptics are being healed and every he deals with every situation. She started to get some hope and a little something went into her filing cabinet. Little hope. Then she'd hear it again. It was affirmed. Oh, yeah, he's coming to town. Wow. She put that in her filing cabinet. And then one day she heard he was in town because the crowd was shouting maybe a couple of blocks from her house. And so that day she did something. She pulled something out of her filing cabinet. And she says, I will. I will go. I'm going to see him. And so she put something over her head so that they wouldn't know who she was. And she went out into the crowd, and there was such a big crowd she couldn't get through. Can you imagine the determination she had that she was going to get something from Jesus? Because something was planted in her, in her filing cabinet. She gets down. I can see her getting down on her hands and knees and crawling between the legs of people. And she could hear where he was preaching, and she'd go. And finally, she found him, and she sees him just two feet away, and she reaches out her hand. And the moment she touches him, she gets healed instantly, and she knew in her body that he had touched her because something changed in her filing cabinet, and she did what Jesus put in there. That's how we need to live. We need to live with those miracles. I want to tell you about a miracle in my life. Something happened to me on the 18th of October of last year. It was a Wednesday. I was working in the backyard. Suddenly, I lifted, you know, a few things, which I did all my life. And I've had lots of muscle strains. That's common. You get over them. But something hit me in my chest that day. And I came into the house. I sort of took it easy. Came into the house. I, of course, I didn't tell Pastor Beth. I don't tell her all this stuff. And so I was wa walking around, the, you know, all day and just continuing to do some stuff and we had a small group that night so we had the people over and served them and and loved on them a little bit and, and then you finally you know they went home about nine or eight thirty or nine and uh i was glad when they went home that night and uh because i was tired i was getting real very weary and it was heavy and it was painful and i went to bed about 10 o'clock but i couldn't go to sleep it was just too painful i couldn't rest i couldn't lay down so i got up and went downstairs to the green chair. The green chair is where miracles happen, by the way. If you come to my house, you sit in the green chair, you get healed. Yeah, for sure. And so I was sitting there, and I began to, um, I began to ask the Lord, what's this all about? I need you, Lord. About midnight, I took a Advil. And uh, half an hour later or so, an hour later, I took another one because the pain kept getting worse and stronger. And I thought, I think it's my heart. I'm having a problem here. So I went into my filing cabinet, and I began to pull out all those hundreds of files that I had stored there over the years, over the last 50 years, and I began to pull them out. All those scriptures, they started to come out. John 10, 10. The devil comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, but I have come that you may have life, and that more abundantly. I said, Jesus, today, right here in my green chair, I'm taking abundant life. And I began to talk to the Lord, spend a couple of hours with the Lord. In fact, I spent four hours fighting over, over this, battling, bringing the scriptures into my life. I pulled out the words of Psalm 91, 1 and 2. 
He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I trust. I'm not settling for anything less. And then I went to Proverbs chapter 4. Very powerful scripture that I got many years ago from the Lord. My son, attend to my words. Attend to, attend to. Listen to what I'm saying. Get them in your, get, observe them with your eyes and get them in the middle of your heart. For those words are life to those who find them. Only those who find. They're not for those who look from a distance. They're for the, those who find, those who dig, those who get the principle established in their heart. And I began to confess those back to the Lord. I went to Romans chapter 8 verse 11. You know, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, that same spirit that raised him from the dead, he works in your mortal body to bring you life. That's his work. And I began to confess that to the Lord, the promises that he gave me. Actually, I even went to James 5, verse 14. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, the Bible says, if any be sick among you, that you should call for the elders of the church, lay hands on the sick, and... Uh, and, and uh, and the Lord will raise them up. Yeah. So I laid my hands on myself because I'm an elder. And I laid my hands on myself. And I thought, I'm one of those guys who's sick right now. I'm doing it in Jesus' name. In fact, I think I even anointed myself with oil. Why not? I'm a he too. I'm a person too. It's not just for them. Come on up, worship team. Well, that day, I, and, and I had written a devotional. There's actually, there's 31 files in this devotional. Month of October. It's all about healing. And I read the whole thing. 31 files. I emptied into myself. And then I read it again. And I read this 12 times a year. Because it's, re it's, it's reminding me of the covenant I have with God and the promises he's made to me for a long life. Okay. There's some right over there on the table. If you want one afterwards, go and get it. There's 31 files for free that you don't even have to dig for that I have dug them out over 40 years. And you can have one. So go and help yourself afterwards. So 4 o'clock came. And the pain was getting so powerful in my life. I said, in my chest, I said, I'm going to have a heart attack. But Jesus is still my answer. He's, whether I have a hangnail or a heart attack, same, same Jesus does the same work. So... I went upstairs, woke Beth up. I said, uh, I think I might need some help. Um, she called the ambulance. And so the EMS, they, they come to the house. Ten minutes later, they were there. I just got dressed. And Beth got dressed. We went downstairs. And they came to the house with all the stuff in their arms. They were going to come in and see this old guy who's having a heart attack. They were going to fix me up. Anyway, they came to the door. They were so quick, so respectful. I said, I can walk. So I went with the word of God in my heart, all these files on my heart. And I went, to, I went out, got out, got out my, the door of my house, walked over to where they, they were parked along the street. And the moment I stepped into that ambulance, Jesus healed me. He healed me. All the symptoms left instantly. All I had is a little discomfort where the muscles around my heart had been gathering a little help for me. And Jesus healed me that day. I sat down in that ambulance, and he made me take my shirt off. Can you imagine? And they stuck all these things over, all over me. And you know what I thought to myself? Those suckers are going to hurt when they come off. <laughs> and I never realized that was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Well, if they're going to hurt, and if they come off, that means that you're alive. I didn't realize till later, days later, that the Holy Spirit was telling me something. So I went, went through the process, went to the hospital, got checked out. Had to, I, they said, you, you have to have blood work. I said, well, I'll go and get it tomorrow and send it to you. No, 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 you're doing it now. So they had to take me there to the hospital, do some blood work. And a cardiologist came and checked me over. And, and uh, she was having trouble getting into my veins. I said, my veins are good, no problem. I said... Uh, she said, oh, I used to work in prison. No, don't worry. I said, what were you in for? She was poking around. I thought she should go back. So 
anyway, they got the blood work. Then I had to wait three hours to have blood work. So I had to go have some lunch, breakfast. And, and they did some more blood work. And the cardiologist comes and he slaps something on my chest. And he looks at the computer and he looks at your heart, my heart. And he says, oh, your heart's a little big, but it looks good. Real good. I was reminded later that when Jesus healed the lepers, he said, go to the priest and have them check you out. If there's any kind of sign at all that you have any kind of lep leprosy or anything to do with leprosy, it's not my work. And I realized that day, this was the work of Jesus because he said, you're good to go. And I felt since that day, I felt stronger, healthier, more, more invigorated to serve God. Next, the next week, I, I went home. The next week, I booked a trip to Cuba because it's time to go to work. And so we booked a trip to Cuba to help them. You know, the, the day after this happened, when Jesus touched my life in a powerful, such a powerful way, I was walking through the house, and this is what the Holy Spirit said. You've been in the secret place with me. I thought, that's where I want to be. And I want to have what's inside me that will bring me to that place on a daily basis. Look for miracles, my friends. Believe God for, the great, for the, the, a great life, for a miracle life. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you today that you have not changed, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. What you did then, you'll do now. And I want to thank you for the great miracle life that you have ordained for each of us that's gathered here today. We just want to honor you for, for the fruit that you give us in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a name that levels mountains. on highways through the sea I've seen his power and rival battles right in front of me There's a faith that stands to fight Sends Goliath to his knees Do miracles, you will do what 
Thanks for that great message, Pastor Richard. So good. Hey, I'm Renee. This is my husband, Scott. Uh, we serve on the venue Dream Team. And I don't know, I just kind of think that we, we came, we saw what Pastor Richard and Pastor Beth, Pastor Corey and Pastor Aaron had in their filing cabinet. We wanted to be closer, so we just kind of kept showing up and showing up and showing up and showing up. And so anyway, it's a blessing to get to be part of this. Yeah. If you're new, uh, we want to get to know you. Uh, we have a seven-minute party in the lobby. Uh, come meet our people and just hear a little bit about what uh, we're doing, and we want to hear a little bit about you. And we got a free gift for you. Yeah. Um, also, if you're not in a small group yet, uh, get in one. We've got uh, small groups every day of the week, and there's just a blessing for you in those small groups. Uh, so come check one out. That's so real. If you want to sign up for a small group, you can go ahead and scan that QR code. You will also see on there we have a baptism coming up. Um, if you're wondering what baptism is, if it's for you, what to do, all of those things, just go ahead uh, and sign up there or stop by the brick wall, um, and we'll just help you out with taking the next step towards that. And hey, this Wednesday, 7 o'clock p.m., like Pastor Corey mentioned in his intro, Pastor Jakin is going to be here for First Wednesday. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be an amazing night of worship, prayer, and and then a great, great message from Pastor Jakin. And there will be steaks. You'll see what I mean when you get there. <laughs> Speaking of steaks, uh, men's breakfast is uh, oh, happening on Saturday. So uh, men, sign up. Uh, we got breakfast, uh, 15 bucks. Bring, bring other men with you. Uh, Pastor Corey has a, a word for us. And it's always an anointing on all us men. So good. Uh, and then uh, Sunday, next Sunday, uh, we're having pizza with pastors uh, after the third service. Yeah. Uh, sign up if you want to hear a little bit more from our pastors, what the vision of the church is. And if you have questions for the pastors, you yeah. get to sit down and uh, enjoy a meal with them after the third service. That's and so scan good. the QR code for that too. Yeah, that's great. And ladies, we have If Gathering Women's Conference coming up February 23rd and 24th. It is an amazing time we get to spend together. Uh, so the QR, we say the QR code about 100 times in this, but everything that you need is there. So go ahead, make sure you get signed up. And just so you know, we have a few, a few sponsorship um, opportunities available there. So go ahead and just stop by the brick wall um, if you might need one of those. And uh, also on the QR code, you'll see venue you kids camp is open for registration that's this summer it's an amazing week this summer there are two spots to register one you register your kids to attend two you register yourself to volunteer uh, we're excited to see um, all of you guys and it's so fun to get to be a part of that so you hear us say at venue church we give because we love and we love to give I am gonna pray for you and then tell you how you can do that um, God, we thank you so much for your faithfulness, God, and uh, thank you for just um, filling our filing cabinets as we lean in this morning, God, and I just pray that in obedience as we give, you would bless uh, the tithes and offerings as they come in this morning, God, and just bless every person, every family in the building. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so you guys can give scanning the QR code to get to the Church Center app. Uh, you can send an e-transfer or at the brick wall, all forms of giving there. Uh, if you're still uh, feeling something uh, from the Holy Spirit and uh, you're ready to purge your file cabinet and looking for that miracle, uh, go see the Care and Prayer team over yeah. here. They're, uh, they're there to pray for you, to help you process that, uh, that hunger inside you. And then also uh, communion's over there, and they can help you with that. That's so good. At Venue Church, we're here to help people know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. Life saved is worth everything. See you Wednesday. <laughs>